Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible. We're going to start off in the book of Matthew. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This will be part five of the holy days in the Bible, the plan of salvation. This is going to be uh, the third installment of the Trump or Trumpets. I did in the last study all, I finished up everything that was in the Old Testament. Now we're going to take a look at Trump or Trumpet in the New Testament. It appears only 13 times. So go to the book of Matthew. We're going to take a look at verse 1. All right, Jesus speaking. Take heed, in other words, pay attention, that ye do not your alms before men. Alms is just a old English way of saying charity. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the sin of Gog, and in the streets. So don't be like those hypocrites that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So what do the hypocrites do? They blow a horn, you know, a trumpet. And while everybody's looking at them, they do their little charity work. But they're doing it so that you know, they could be seen of everybody and everybody think, oh, isn't he a wonderful guy? But what does Jesus say? Verse 3. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the sin of Gog, and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do. Huh. I wonder if um, the Hail Mary's... Uh, or the rosary, praying the rosary, I wonder if that qualifies as vain repetitions. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard of their much speaking. But be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And then we got the Lord's Prayer. But uh, let's skip ahead here. Let's go to Matthew 24. Now, I covered this in the last study, but we'll read it again. Uh, Joel chapter 2, Matthew 24, Revelation 6, if memory serves me correctly. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, 
shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Now, that's a very, very important thing. Uh, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I mean, this verse almost in and of itself could destroy the pre-trib rapture idea. You know? Gathering the elect. Well, of course, what they'll do is to say, well, you know, the church is the bride and then the elect. Well, that's the you-know-who's in the Middle East that have been rejecting Christ for almost 2,000 years. That's their little argument there. How about 1 Corinthians 14, verse 8? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Oh, and I forgot to mention, I did in the last study, but I'll say it again. First time the uh, a trumpet sounds, that's recorded in the Bible was when they went to the mount where Moses went to meet the Lord to get the uh, Ten Commandments. So it was a call to the people to assemble themselves for the Lord. You know, sort of like the Muslims call the prayer. So when you heard the when you heard the trump blast, the trumpet blast, all the people were to be gathered together. For assembled for the Lord. Another time trumpets were used was to, as a warning for the city, that an enemy army was approaching. And another time the trumpets would blast was to tell the army what to do. For example, in uh, the old Western movies, remember the cavalry would come and they'd be blowing the trump. Uh, well, a bugle, but a bugle's a type of trumpet, you know. <laughs> Charge! You know, that's what they used. The trumpet or the bugle was used to re uh, re relay commands to the people. Charge, retreat. Perhaps you've heard Reveille in the morning telling everybody to wake up. Or they played taps at night when the end of the day, I guess you could say. So, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Good question. All right, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. All right, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and I guess we'll do in verse 38 and read the rest of the chapter. This is a long chapter, and I don't want to get off the track of the trump or trumpet. Uh, and here we're talking about bodies, whether it be a earthly body or a spiritual resurrected body. It's talking about the resurrection, this chapter. Verse 38. 
1 Corinthians 15, 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Okay, what's celestial? What is that? Well, according to Webster's 1828, which I can't say enough good things about Webster's 1828. He was a, a language scholar, a linguist, and a believer. But he says celestial, an adjective. Heavenly, belonging or relating to heaven, dwelling in heaven as celestial spirits. Uh, celestial joys, hence the word conveys the idea of superior excellence, delight, purity, etc. Um, let's see. So, yeah, it pertains to heaven, the heavens. What does terrestrial mean? Well, have you ever heard of the word terrain? You know, uh, like... Uh, this, uh, this, this dirt road is some rugged terrain. Well, it has reference to, uh, Terra has reference to Earth. So you got heaven, and then you got Earth. So that's the difference between celestial and terrestrial. Verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. And when I was in elementary school, sixth grade, I was very interested in astronomy. I thought I wanted to be an astronomer and uh, used to uh, have uh, access to a professional telescope. I mean, I had my own, but this one was probably cost more money than a new car. On top of the uh, Miami Museum of Science and Space Planetarium, used to be a member there. And... Uh, stars were different colors you know some were white some were yellow some were uh, at least one i knew was red there was another it used to like look like it was changing changing colors so yeah there's different uh, glories of the stars for one star differeth from another star in glory so also is the resurrection of the dead It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now, this is speaking about believers. In our bodies, our bodies are subject to original sin nature that fell upon Adam and Eve and all their children. Hence, why Jesus had to be born with the virgin birth. If you got a Bible and it doesn't say virgin in Isaiah 14, you got Satan's commentary. And uh, if you hang around Bible studies on YouTube long enough, you'll, you'll run into those that say, oh, well, you're one of those King James Bible people. Oh, oh, they're a cult. They're terrible. They're horrible. Well, if you want to have a Bible that uh, just says, well, you know, Mary was a young woman. Um, there was a five-year-old down in South America that got pregnant. Is that young enough for you? You think that was a miracle? I don't. I don't. I think she gave birth at six years old. Figure that one out. 
boy, good thing that wasn't my daughter. I would have somebody. I'd probably have been in prison for the for killing them. But um, yeah, I'm not one to talk. But um, virgin, the virgin birth is important for a reason, so that our sinful nature was not passed on to Christ. And uh, so if you've got a Bible that doesn't say virgin, uh, you got Satan's commentary. What can I tell you? So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. You see, our bodies are, we're sown, you know, uh, if you take a look at the word sperm in the Greek, it's the same word that they use for seed, sperma. You know, a man's seed fertilizes a woman's egg. So, you know, the earthly body is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. What? What's that all about, Chaplain Bob? Well, let me tell you. All right. Uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. But Genesis 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. No woman involved. Okay? Adam had the same mother and father as Jesus. And I'll show you that in a minute. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. All right. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. So God formed a body from the dirt, from the earth, breathed into him the breath of life. And if you look at that word, breathed, or wind, it's the same word as spirit in the Greek, pneuma. The first Man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You see, Adam had the same mother and father as Jesus' earthly body. That's why Jesus is called here the last Adam. The first Adam had no mother, and God the Father, right? And Jesus is called the last Adam because his earthly body had the same parents as the first Adam. Now in Luke 3, we get some, uh, we get some uh, genealogy. So I'm just going to Take a quick look, because I don't want to make this a big genealogical study. Um, and people will quote the um, where Paul says, you know, don't uh, don't get into endless genealogies, which you know create questions and not answers. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, 
that's true. Endless genealogies. But the thing is, you know, these genealogies are in the Bible for a reason. Because there is a certain seed line that the Lord made promises to. Now, I know people try to make you think, oh, it's the whole world. It's the whole world. I don't think so. I wouldn't uh I don't see anything coming good from Canaan. Now there's there's two Canaans in the Bible. There's one from Ham and that's the one I'm referring to. But then there's another Canaan from um Seth Seth's line. So let's go to Luke 3 verse 33 36 which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Shem, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Ma Ma Malel Malilel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the Son of God. What? Which was the Son of Adam, which was the Son of God. Adam was the Son of God. In Job 38, the, the angels were called the sons, plural, the sons of God, because after all, who was their father? And who was the angel's mother? I don't think they had one. Bible doesn't say, but I that's just that was, that's my guess, you know. I don't think uh, the angels had a mother. I think they had the same mother and father as uh, the first Adam and the last Adam. Now, yes, Adam is called a son of the son of God. Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God. Big difference. The only begotten Son of God. Christ is. And then Adam's the Son of God. And then the angels are called the sons of God, plural. Believers do not become sons of God until the New Testament when they're born again of, or born from above, of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. All right, so back to 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 45. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. See, Christ was made a quickening spirit. Why? Because he sends the Holy Spirit. I guess I ought to prove that, huh? All right, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And you know all these uh, Pentecostal churches that are always, oh, the Holy Ghost this and the Holy Ghost that. Well, Jesus said that they, the Holy Spirit would, the Holy Ghost would testify of him. Yeah. All right, back to 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first that, uh, be, I'm sorry, howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, 
and afterward which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You know, when you're resurrected body, you're going to bear the image of the heavenly. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And here's the punchline. Here's the $64,000 the question. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, uh, you know, dead. That's what it means by sleeping. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, what's it been talking about? The earthly and the heavenly, right? It's talking about the resurrection. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, at the last trump. Wow, Chaplain Bob, when's the last trump? Uh, well, as far as I can tell, they're in the book of Revelation. There's seven of them. And uh, let's see, is the first one the last? No. Second one last? No. Third one last? No. How about four? No. Five? No. Six? No, but you're getting closer. Seven. Yes, the seventh one is the last one. And where is that? Uh, it's at the end of the tribulation. This one verse puts the nail in the coffin to the pre-trib rapture. Or I should say, puts the wooden stake into the heart of this evil blood-drinking vampire that sucked the life, blood, out of the church. Jesus said, occupy till I come. Not sit around on a pillow and cover your eyes and your ears and your mouth and say nothing and see nothing and hear nothing. The song is supposed to be onward Christian soldiers, not backward Judeo-Zionist. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, raised, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is the resurrection, people. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. I hope I, hope I am doing what uh, the Lord wants me to do. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
Praise God for that. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. Ignorant means you don't know something. Doesn't mean you're dumb. Doesn't mean you're stupid. Just means you lack knowledge in a specific subject area sort of like me when it comes to calculus or rocket science or brain surgery i am i plead ignorance you ever heard that expression ignorance of the law is no excuse in a court of law yeah yeah quarter of a million plus laws on the books and uh you're supposed to know every single one of them that's why uh, top defense lawyers tell you, never talk to the police if you can help it. Uh, especially if they bring you in under uh, suspicion. Yeah, if you're a, a, a witness to a crime, yeah, I guess you should. But uh, other than that, make sure you always say, uh, Sir, I would uh, uh, like to speak to an attorney before I answer any questions sir and then shut up yeah yeah it's there is no fifth amendment rights anymore people i heard that from a i think it's Dwayne james yeah there is no fifth amendment anymore supreme court struck that down so the only defense you have is to uh you know, has, demand that you speak to an attorney before you answer any questions. Yeah. Very, very important. If you're any, ever in any legal trouble, that is, you know, which is very easy to do. So. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Uh, the dead, right? Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Yeah, if you don't have Christ, you have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And that is the gospel. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? That's the gospel, pretty much. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, if you believe in the pre-trib rapture, that means uh, Jesus comes halfway to earth with the people, then grabs the church, and then goes back to heaven. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they, uh, never mind. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And just remember, every pre-trib rapture, secret, secret pre-trib rapture, always comes with a shout, right? Yeah. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Uh, I think it's the seventh trump, but, you know, it just tells you with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, if all the pre-tribbers are up in heaven and all the dead in Christ, people that have died for the last five, six thousand years are all up in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What happens to those people that are on earth dying for their faith in Christ? Do they miss the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb? Is that how that works? Uh, the Bible says that the... Uh, the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, 
if the pre-trib rapture happens and people die for their faith in the tribulation, how can the dead in Christ rise first? Uh, that's just some questions for your friendly neighborhood pre-trib rapture Spider-Man. Uh, yeah. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yeah. With their web of deceit. The dead in Christ can't rise first if there's a pre-trib rapture. It's impossible. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, see the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I know I've said it a bunch of times and I'm repeating myself over and over and over, but if we're not caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. This is probably one of the most important things that an, somebody that lives in the end times, uh, if they ever see the man of sin, the, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist appear on the face of the earth, it's probably one of the most important things that you'll ever know in your life. When the true Christ comes, we're going to be caught up together in the air to be with him. Important, people. Very important. All right, let's go to the book of Hebrews. Uh, now, if you don't remember part one of this study... The first time that the word trumpet appeared was when Moses went up into the mount uh, with the congregation, the assembling of the congregation under the mount, and they were told, don't touch the mount. Only Moses went up into the mount, and then later Aaron, where they got the Ten Commandments written in stone, I, yeah, I believe, I think, I think it was a... I'm not, it, they might have got the Ten Commandments later, but Moses went up into the mount and there was thick darkness, there was lightning, there was thunder, there was trumpets. Uh, so keep that in mind. And the people were told, don't touch the mount. All right, Hebrews 12, 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. See, there's a difference between earthly sinful, wicked Jerusalem that's likened unto Sodom and Egypt. And then there's a heavenly Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. Big difference between the two people. Verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, not the renewed covenant. Sorry, Hebrew roots people, but it's not a renewed covenant. It's a new covenant. Read Jeremiah 31, 31. Yeah, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Why a new one? Because they couldn't keep the old one. Verse 
Verse 24, Hebrews 12, 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that, you, uh, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth? But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Remember Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 talks about the earth shake, uh, the or heavens shaken, the heavens and the earth. Verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Wow. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Did you know that? God is a consuming fire. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to do every single place where the word trump or trumpet appears. And we're going to finish this. Uh, uh, well, I've got on, the, on just trumpets. I've done three Bible studies. And then I've still got to do the Day of Atonement. And then um, tabernacles. So I'm going to be busy. And then after that, I don't know. All right, let's do Revelation chapter 1. Verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ... You know, I have people say, oh, I don't understand revelation. Well, the word revelation means to reveal. That's where the word reveal, it comes from the same root word. A revelation means to understand something. If you don't understand the book of Revelation, it's because you've never read the entire Bible, because all the symbolism comes from the Old Testament, as far as I know. I mean, you just can't read the last chapter in a, in a novel and expect to understand the book. It just doesn't work that way. And the Bible's no different. Start in Genesis 1-1 and finish at Revelation chapter 22. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Ah. Well, you know, when you're talking in God's time frame, 2 Peter says, a day, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. So when the, when the Lord says, must shortly come to pass, you're, it's like saying, well, in a day or two. You know, in a day or two, to the Lord. And of course, people will say, ah, well, shortly come to pass. Uh, 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 people only live for, you know, maybe a hundred years. And, you know, and then John, blah, blah, blah. And, and all this has to be passed because it says right here, must shortly come to pass. So revelation's been fulfilled. That's what they'll tell you. And they got a big fancy theological word that they use called preterism. Well, I don't think so. The, you know, 
To the Lord, it's a day or two. A couple of days. You know? But uh, you got to realize, most of these people are churchgoers. They're probably unsaved or they either work for or are children of the enemy. And that's what they do. They sow discord and lies. And uh, luckily, if you believe in luck, blessedly, I don't work for a church. I don't have a church board telling me what I can and cannot teach. So the only one I got to answer to is Christ and his Father. That's it. So if I teach something wrong, I'll have to give an account one day, but not today. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. Do you know that the book of Revelation, um, they had a church council, and the deceivers will try to make you think that the Catholic Church is the one that picked all the books in the Bible. That's not true. The Church of Rome was but one church. There was a lot of Greek churches that were in this council. And they decided what books belonged in the Bible. So when you start hearing things about, oh, well, the secret books of the Bible were left out. Well, you got books like the uh, Gospel of Thomas doesn't belong in the Bible. It's garbage. See, they were trying to stick in those false books even back then. But there was a church that voted against the book of Revelation being in the Bible. You know what that church, where it was? In a city called Laodicea. Yeah. Yeah, God didn't uh, God didn't say any many nice things about Laodicea. So, uh, yeah. They didn't like the book of Revelation. But all the other churches said, this belongs in the Bible. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not exactly crazy about the book of Esther, but I'm not going to be one to tell you to take it out. So, verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Did you know that people that read and hear the words of this prophecy are blessed? Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, when it's talking about Asia, it's talking about what we call Asia Minor. Basically, Greece and uh, what is today modern-day Turkey. Because those uh, peaceful Muslims, I'm being a little sarcastic there, uh, the Ottoman Turks invaded and killed all the Greeks, all, all the Christians, killed them. And then when they conquered the area, they renamed it Turkey after the Ottoman Turks. Uh, Istanbul used to be called Constantinople. Why did the Lord allow it to be taken? I don't know, but there had to have been sin involved. 
Because honestly, if that if they would have been totally righteous before the Lord, I bet you the Lord would have brought fire down from heaven and devoured the armies of the the Muslims. But I don't know. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Boy, I'll tell you, that is a powerful verse. I'm going to read that again. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so Amen. I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. This is basically saying A to Z, people. I am A to Z. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Little note here. John was called uh, the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, I don't know how true this is. But this is a legend. According to legend, they tried to kill John. They couldn't kill him. They tried. They couldn't kill him. So what did they do? They banished him on to the Isle of Patmos. I mean, <laughs> you know, all the other apostles died for their faith. Well, except for Judas, who hung himself. But, uh, you know, they all, uh, all recorded as dying for their faith. And, uh, and pre-trib rapture people think that they're better than the apostles. Really. And if you want to read some really good writings, uh, you could read about Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P. And uh, I think his name is Iron. Some people, I've heard it called Irenaeus and Irenaeus. I-R-E-N-A-U-S, I believe it is. Um, one of them was a disciple of John. And the other was the disciple of the disciple of John. You ought to read their writings. Very interesting. I mean, you're talking people that hung out with people that hung out with John, one of the apostles that was trained by Christ himself for, what, three-something years? Yeah. 
Uh, it's a lot better than anything you'll read from in the garbage that uh, they teach in these uh, in the books in the so-called Christian bookstores or any of these garbage preachers on YouTube or on television. And that's not to say everybody on YouTube's bad. They're not. There's probably a handful that are pretty decent. I'm sure they're better than I am. Some better than I am. That's for sure. There's always somebody better than you. But the point is, they have some interesting writings. And the stuff they teach today is totally foreign to people that lived back then. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, trouble, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. A voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardius, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, as far as I know, this is the only place in the Bible that describes what Jesus looks like. It says, His head and his hairs. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Of course, the black Hebrews would say, Oh, yeah, his hair, his hair is like, woolly. It doesn't say that. It says his hair and his head were white like wool. As white as snow. Doesn't say his hair was woolly. Doesn't say that. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. What color is fire? Well, depending upon what's burning and what the flame is, it could be yellow, it could be orange, it could be red. But have you ever seen a, a propane stove? The flame is blue. So, does he have blue eyes? I, your guess is as good as mine. Verse 15. And his feet like undefined brass, and they as if burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. You know what color brass is when you burn it in a furnace? It's kind of a, a whitish with a, um, a golden brown color, like a golden color. Yeah, because brass is copper. Copper is kind of a reddish. But when it gets hot, it has a whitish hue to it. Interesting, huh? All right, let's forget that. I think I'm going to skip verse four, uh, chapter 4. And let's go to Revelation chapter 8. Yeah, Revelation chapter 8. All right, Revelation 8 and verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. 
and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. You know, this is, uh, you read the plagues of Revel uh, uh, the plagues of Egypt during the, the first, uh, when God was trying to get Pharaoh to let Israel go, the Passover in Egypt. Matthew 24. I mean, there it is, people. And an earthquake. Ooh. Verse 6. Revelation 8 and verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. You know, this is just like um, if you click on my name on the um, my homepage, you'll see playlists. You click on that where I do a playlist on the comparing the plagues of Egypt with the plagues of Revelation. There's a lot of similarities there. There's some differences too. Um, the similarities are easy to pick. The differences, I don't know why the differences are. Maybe one day the Lord will reveal it to me, but as of right now, I don't know why the, the plagues are different. There's some differences. So, I wish I knew, but I don't. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now, people will tell you, oh, well, this happened in 70 AD. All this stuff is past. Really? Uh, where is this in recorded history where a third of everything in the ocean turns to blood and everything dies? I must have missed that in history class. And let me tell you something, people. I was doing some research on this, on the third part of the waters. Um, I, this is my guess, okay? This is just Bob's theory. According to oceanographers, the Pacific Ocean in and of itself is a third of all the waters on the planet, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, during World War II, ships could be at sea for days and never see land for days. I mean, planes could have a, a thousand mile range and fly and not see any land at all, depending upon where they were. I mean, the Pacific Ocean is vast. Vast. And it's the deepest part, too. Look at the, uh, they call it the Marianas Trench. You could put the Empire State Building in the Marianas Trench, and it would, wouldn't even, doesn't even come close to the surface. So, is the Pacific Ocean where this happens? I don't know. But if it did, it would be approximately a third of all the water of the earth. Verse 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it, it, as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. Oh, let's read verse 9 again. 
Um, verse 8. Verse 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. I can't find that in history. So, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Oh, we're only four out of seven here. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Bad news, people. Well, for the inhabitants of the earth. All right, let's do Revelation 9. Verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Um, little note here. Now the smoke with um, the smoke of the bottomless pit that darkens the sun and the sky. Um, I don't know uh, if this is true, but I'm going to take a stab at what I think the Lord will use. Take a look at history. In the year 1815, in the month of April, there was a volcano they call it mount tambora it is in indonesia in the island of sumbawa the next year in 1816 it was known as the year without a summer yeah no summer there were there was snow in July up in New England and in Europe. Well, guess what happens when you plant your crops and it snows? And that was July. Can you imagine? They called it the poverty year. And they also nicknamed it 1800 and froze to death unbelievable they called it the year without a summer because of all the I guess all the volcanic ash unbelievable because of the uh, the volcano put up so much ash and smoke and it was just you know it was recorded in history so it was, uh, can you imagine that? It regularly snowed in New England in July. I mean, unbelievable. So let's go back to Revelation 9, verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, I'm not saying that is a fulfillment. I'm just saying my guess, you know. 
And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Uh, you know, take a look at this. You know, these, these pre-tribbers will tell you that uh, everybody else is gone. All, all, all the pre-trib people, you know, they want you to think that everybody that's got, had the seal of God is gone. They, in the pre-trib rapture, they're gone. So why would God be telling these, uh, these scorpion-like things not to sting anybody that has the seal of God? Huh? Good question for your pre-trib rapture uh, church. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Wow. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it, uh, were, as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, which is a destroyer, if I remember correctly. One woe was past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded. Oh, boy. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had this trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Wow. A third part of men. Uh, ask your people that says that all this stuff happened in 70 AD. All this stuff was fulfilled in 70 AD. Ask them in recorded history, when did a third of men die in 70 AD? They didn't. Didn't happen. Um, now, when Europe, years and years and years later, like I think a thousand years later, when they had the Black Death, the bubonic plague, about 25% or a quarter of Europe died from the bubonic plague. And that was horrible. Every day they would take carts and go through the cities and gather up the dead. Uh, I remember that Monty Python movie. I don't remember which one it was. But um, they were bringing out the, the cart and Bring out your dead. Bring out the dead. And, uh, yeah, I think it was the Holy Grail. What a blasphemous movie, but I thought it was hilarious at the time, but, yeah. Bring out your dead. So when did a third part of the people die? Never. So this has to be future, you know. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. 
Do you know what 200,000 thousand is? I ran the numbers before, and I think that's 200 million. That is one huge army. And as far as I know, there's only one country on the face of the earth, and this is the first time in the history of the world that any one country could field a 200 million man army. You want to know who that is? Red Communist China. They have a population of at least 1.5 billion. So even if half that was women, you got 700 million men to draw an army with. So just take everybody between the ages of 18 and 40. That would be at least 200 million, I'm sure. You know, all the children and all the elderly, you can, you know, 200 million. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Uh, makes me think of tanks. What do you, I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading into that. I don't know. Don't pay attention to me. But, um, uh, by these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. So here it is, people are dying on these plagues, yet repented not yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Uh, repentance is very important, people. Let me tell you something. If you, you ever hear a preacher that tells you that, um, doesn't tell you to repent of your past deeds, your wickedness, your evilness, and no, there's none righteous, no, not one, except for Christ, of course. But if, if they don't preach repentance, you're listening to a false teacher. One of the devil's kids, in all likelihood. I, I have a hard time thinking anybody that's saved, being led of the Spirit, would, would not know to teach people repentance. John the Baptist, whom Jesus said was the greatest of all the prophets that were born of women, taught repentance. Jesus taught repentance. Peter taught repentance. In the book of Acts, repent, very important. But these people wouldn't repent of their murders, their sorceries, or their fornication, or their thefts. Nope, wouldn't have it. All right, let's read Revelation 11. We're getting close to closing out this uh, study. Verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So this is not an earthly temple. This is the heavenly temple. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given... Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong here. Yeah, I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, and there was given me a reed like unto a, a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. I was wrong. 
Uh, there is a, a temple in heaven. Verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. One of these is Elijah. Some people say the second one will be Moses. Others say Enoch. Your guess is as good as mine. Personally, I lean towards Enoch because the only reason being is um, he's one of the only two people in the uh, Old Testament that never died. But then again, people will say, well, you know, Moses was... And Eno, uh, Elijah appeared with Jesus in the transfiguration on the mount. So your guess is as good as mine. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceeded, proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now remember, Elijah, uh, King Ahab, sent 50 soldiers and a captain to take Elijah. And he called down fire from heaven and devoured them, all 51 of them. Oh yeah, he did that not once but twice. Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't do it by his own power. I mean, you know, the Lord did it, but the Lord had, uh, he said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from the sky and devour you and your 50. Boom. Gone. Barbecue. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And if you want to read about Elijah calling down fire from the sky, uh, you can read in 2 Kings chapter 1 and specifically verse 10. Well, let's read 9 and 10. 2 Kings chapter 1 verse 9. Then the king sent to him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Oh, yeah. So, let's go. Revelation 11, 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, my opinion is the false prophet of the beast, the Antichrist, I think he's going to pretend to be Elijah. And he's going to have power to do lying, uh, false signs and lying wonders, false, uh, satanic miracles. And matter of fact, he's going to be able to do bring down fire from the sky too. So there might actually be two Elijahs running around at the same time. So that's my guess. I mean, I'm not you know, that's thus saith Bob Walker. That's not thus saith the Lord by any means. But if I was the man of sin, the beast, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, and I had a false prophet, that's what I would do. I'd tell everybody, oh, this is Elijah. And I'm the, the Messiah. You know, I mean, if I was the devil, that's what I would do. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. 
and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. See, in the days of Elijah and Ahab, um, Elijah had it not rain in Israel for, I think, three years. I mean, you know, can you imagine no rain for three years? Uh, it'd be pretty hard to grow crops. So there was famine. And didn't Moses, or rather, uh, use his rod and touch the waters and they turned to blood? Oh, yeah. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city. Ah, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So all these people running around saying, oh, the great city... Uh, that's New York City or uh, Rome, you know, Vatican City. Uh, was the Lord crucified in New York? Um, not my Lord. Was my Lord crucified in Rome or Vatican City? Uh, no. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Where are these guys going to preach? Jerusalem. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer or allow and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another sounds like christmas time to me because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth yeah they're going to be happy that god's prophets were killed by the beast and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Oh boy, can you imagine... These two guys are dead for three days and a half. And then a voice from heaven says, come up hither. Oh boy. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. You see, there will be a remnant saved in the tribulation, and they're going to give glory to the God of heaven. And they're going to say, we've been worshiping the fault wrong God. Those stupid Christians, we thought, they were right all along. Verse 14, the second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. Remember the last trump? There's seven trumps, seven trumpets. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. See, when the seventh angel sounds, it's over for 
the people of this earth. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God. Who are these four and twenty elders? My guess would be uh, the twelve sons of Israel, the 12 sons, the 12 tribes, and the 12 apostles, uh, Paul, not Judas. That would be my guess. But your guess is probably as good as mine. And the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. You didn't know that God was an environmentalist, did you? And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. See, there's going to be two temples, one on earth, one in heaven. I knew it was in there somewhere. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, all these people looking for the, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testament, you know, in Egypt or in Africa or whatever in Jerusalem. I I don't I don't think so. I don't know. P, some people say Ron Wyatt found the Ark of the Testament. I don't know. I don't know. It makes for a story. You know, the thing is, uh, the you-know-whos that want to build their little temple for their Messiah, uh, they might build a fake ark. You know, Ron Wyatt might have actually found an ark. But I bet you it was planted there by the you-know-whos so that they could uh, do their little temple worship for their Messiah. But as, but I don't know. I don't know. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now remember, people, this was, verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded. This was the seventh trump. And then they proclaimed, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Let's go to Acts chapter 1 real quick. Verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. Taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commended them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Hence, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, 
wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, when it, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, angels, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Ah, so the way he went up is the way he's going to return. Not this one and a half coming. No, it's going to be the second coming. Not a one and a half coming, not a third coming. So, Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded. The last one. This is the last trump. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now there's some there that will try to tell you that trump and trumpet is two different things. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.52 puts a nail to that coffin. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Does that sound like uh, it's talking about two different things? No. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Trump and trumpet. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. A trump and a trumpet is not two different things. Boy, I'll tell you, there's so many deceivers out there. But one day, they're going to have to give an account every idle word that they speak. And so will I. But I don't deceive people on purpose. At least not intentionally. I don't do it. You know, I probably, I'm probably wrong on some things, but I don't do it on purpose. I don't try. So, all right, people. Well, that's when the seventh trump sounds. We're going to be changed. Heavenly bodies resurrected in different bodies. And Christ's kingdom will be forever and ever. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, not renewed Jerusalem, no, new Jerusalem. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, who's the tabernacle of God? Jesus. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a great and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Uh, I don't see a 13th Gentile gate for non-Israelites, do you? I don't either. Verse 13. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lambs. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as a breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, and the length and the breadth and the light height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the fountains of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophilus, chrysophrasis, I don't know, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. John 8, 12, right? And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, people, this is, I guess, the end of part five of this series. And um, I hope you learned something. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.